You're now watching Way Back Wednesday, sponsored by Davenport Auto Park, the ride of your life. And also sponsored by Flora's Glass, serving the area since 1977 with residential and commercial work. and welcome to another episode of Way Back Wednesday. I'm Randy Adcox. Today is Wednesday, May 29th. We're wrapping up the month of May, uh, headed into June, so uh, hang on for summertime. It's on the way. Uh, got a lot of ground to cover tonight. Uh, we're going to go back and, and visit a little bit from last week's show, talk a little bit about Mr. G, uh, G. Miller Thompson. Uh, if you remember last week, we talked a little bit about him. He was the one who founded Thompson's Pharmacy down on Falls Road. And... Um, I did quite a bit of research on Mr. Thompson. Frankly, I was just curious. And so I kind of came up with a, a bit of a mystery there. We'll get into that a little bit later on. Um, and we had a, had a viewer from last week ask about, if you remember when we talked about this a couple times on previous shows, back in the 1950s, there was an exchange club in Rocky Mount. And in fact, the exchange club, we'll talk a little about that too in a, little, in a few minutes here. Um, but it dates back to the early 1900s nationwide. In fact, 1911 was the date it was formed, or year it was formed. Uh, but in 1955, or 1945, excuse me, Rocky Mount uh, had a charter membership uh, here locally for the Exchange Club. And in 1955, um, they purchased a boat uh, and put it in Tar River and were charging people I forgot the amount, it was very little, 20 cent a head, something like that, uh, to ride up and down Tar River. And it was, it was actually uh, a group of ladies who were wives of the men who were exchange club members, and they referred to themselves as the exchangeites. And so the boat was called the exchangeite. That was the question that was uh, asked of me last week, after last week's show. So anyway, we've got a couple of pictures to share with you about that. I'll talk a little bit about the exchange club. There you go, there's the exchange club boat, uh, exchangeite boat itself. Um, as you can see, they paid $4,000 for it in 1955, and, um, you know, it was a, a great idea. I mean, you know, Rocky Mount, the Tar River, you know, kind of uh, since the early days of the Native American Indians of Tuscarora uh, down on the banks of the Tar River, the Tar River has been a means of navigation, at least up to uh, the Rocky Mount Mills area uh, where the falls are, hard to navigate beyond that. Uh, if you're coming from downstream anyway, and hard to go below that if you're going from upstream down. Uh, but the Tar River has been a navigable waterway uh, for centuries, at least from uh, the Pamlico River, that, that part of the state, back up to the falls. And so to give people an opportunity to, to ride and see what's, uh, you know, along the shoreline of Tar River, and if you've never taken that trip, uh, it, it's really an interesting ride. Uh, years ago, I had the occasion, on, on multiple occasions actually, uh, to ride with various friends and people I knew had boats. And um, there are parts on the Tar River, if you've never seen, where the, the banks are really, really steep. You go around a bend and you'll see a, a very steep bank, almost as if you were in the mountains somewhere. Uh, and then there are areas where it's just absolutely gorgeous, uh, great big boulders in the river. And, um, you know, when the river's at a point where you can safely navigate around. When it's, when it's high, it can be dangerous, admittedly. Uh, but there's some really neat scenes along Tar River. If you've never had a chance to do that, um, you should make a point to try to uh, take a boat ride with someone, particularly from behind the dam at Rocky Mount Mills, uh, from that point downstream. It's especially an interesting ride. And you, you, know, you can go all the way to the, the sound on Tar River if you had a mind to do so and had the time to do so. But anyway, so in 1955, this was um, the members of the Exchange Club uh, put the boat in, kind of give it its maiden voyage, if you would. So let us go ahead. The next picture was actually when they started taking passengers out. Um, this was actually from, the first picture was from June the 15th of 1955. This was June the 30th of 1955. And this was its first cruise. And like I say, you see the name there, the Exchange Height was the name of the boat, Exchange Height. Um, and so they, you know, charge uh, uh, fees, if you will, or a fare to ride the boat up and down Tar River. And, I, and it wasn't much. I, I read somewhere, and I want to say a 20 cent, 25 cent per head. 
very negligible amount of money, but it was an interesting ride for folks who didn't have it. And of course, this is up above the mills, obviously, put in it there at Sunset Park. And so you could ride upstream uh, a ways and then ride down toward the mill, and that was kind of the extent of it. But still, it's an interesting ride, too. Okay, Lee, let's move on then. Item number three. Um, I mentioned that, oh, I'm sorry, we've got one more here. I forgot about this one. This is actually, um, I mentioned Exchange Club got started in Rocky Mountain in 1945. And these are the initial members of the Exchange Club here. And you see Dr. Carl Peters, president of the newly formed Exchange Club of Rocky Mountain, is shown here at the left receiving the charter for the club, which was presented last night at the special charter um, uh, a night program at the Ricks Hotel. Uh, from left to right, Dr. Peters, Horace Fulcher of Durham, uh, Toastmaster for the meeting, uh, John Riley of Durham, uh, State President of the Exchange Clubs, uh, C.M. Clark of Durham, District Governor, C.A. Hutton of Durham, President of the Durham Club, and Captain A.C. Barkley of Toledo, Ohio, Assistant Director of the Ext uh, Extension National Exchange Club. So this was a big deal um, for Rocky Mount to become uh, a charter club of the Exchange Club. And, and these things were all over. There was, a, there was the Exchange Club in, in uh, Nashville, for example. There was one in Spring Hope. There was one in Sharpsburg. Um, I didn't see a listing for Tarbor, but I feel fairly safe in saying it was probably one in Tarbor or two. Um, but I found a little short article that kind of gives a, a really good overview of the Exchange Club, what it was, how it got started, uh, and what their purpose was. Um, it says the purpose of the National Exchange Club is to educate, improve, and develop the capabilities of the members of the clubs chartered by the corporation and of the citizens of the communities, municipalities, and states in which such clubs are chartered. Uh, Captain Barkley explained the club is the oldest of the national civic organizations, um, and it goes on to list a bunch of members here. This article is actually uh, from 1945 at the time this picture was taken. But in any case, uh, I will read some of these names because some of these you'll recognize. Local membership comprises D.B. Andrews, Jacob Arnold, I.B. Bailey, M.L. Baker, Paul V. Bullock, C.R. Daltridge, Clyde Forsyth, W.S. Gay, Lyman B. Hoggard, Paul R. Johnson, Clarence Jones, J.W. Knowles, P.M. Lancaster, uh, Lonnie Lester, J.A. Lennon, Carl Mangum, Claude Mayo, uh, E.T. Moore, Afton Morgan, J.B. Overton, uh, L.A. Parrish, Dr. Carl Peters, John Respis, um, that was one of my old neighbors. I didn't know he was a member of the Exchange Club. I remember him. Uh, W.S. Swain, James Tarrant, B.H. Taylor, Harold Jones Thompson, B. Warren Jr., John D. Weaver, M.T. Whitley, M. Williamson, B.B. Williford, Wade Woodley, and R.L. Vine. So, you know, these were just, I want to say civic-minded. I think it's a good way to describe these people, civic-minded people. Uh, they would join this organization. They did a lot of good things. I saw, for example, one article where they actually bought a projector for a lady who was bedridden, and it allowed her from her bed to, uh, they could project, for example, with this projector, uh, books or, you know, pictures or, you know, anything that she wanted to look at. She really couldn't move, and so the projector was, you know, situated beside her bed and projected onto the ceiling above her bed, and she could lay there in bed and, and be entertained uh, by any number of things that could be, you know, ran through the projector and projected up onto the ceiling. And that was just one example of the types of things they would do. They were, you know, instrumental in, in doing projects for the needy and, and the less fortunate and so forth. Um, it is one of the oldest clubs in the nation. It predates a lot of the more well-known clubs. And they're still in existence today. There is still a national exchange club operating in the United States today. It's a shame that the local organizations, the local char uh, charters of the Exchange Club, ceased to exist at some point in the past. I'm not exactly sure when Rocky Mount ceased to, to have meetings and so forth. Um, but the national organization is still in operation and dates back again to 1911. Okay, Lee, let's move on then. Um, we talked a little bit um, about Mr. Uh, uh, G. Miller Thompson in Thompson Nursery. And so, you know, there was a mystery there that I just, I felt like I had to get to the bottom of it, so I, I went looking in earnest to see what I could find about Mr. Miller. And I went back, um, I found out he came from Norman, Oklahoma, first of all. And if you're familiar with Oklahoma, particularly that area around Norman, that is the, the site of the um, Oklahoma University. And so anyway, 
Uh, he graduated in 1916 from Oklahoma University with a degree in pharmaceutical, you see there. And so uh, that was his home. He was born and raised in Norman, Oklahoma. Uh, he went to college right there, right by his home, graduated in 1916 with a degree in pharmaceuticals and began a long, pretty long uh, career uh, in the pharmaceutical industry. Okay, let us move on. Sadly, by 1917, the very next year after he graduated, he graduated in May of 1916, and November of 1917, his father was tragically killed, of all things, by a train. Uh, this is a long article, I'm not gonna read the whole thing, but just kind of give you a quick overview of what happened here. Um, it says, the train was about an hour late coming down the grade into the depot at an extra rate of speed. Mr. Thompson, by himself in a Ford machine, was coming east on, I'm assuming this is a road name, it says Tona, Tonoa, um, I'm thinking that's an Indian name. Anyway, those who saw him stated he was going at a rapid gait. The machine he was in was an open one and he could have had a clear view of the incoming train had he looked. He either did not look or believed he could get across ahead of the train. He failed to do so, the engine hitting the machine squarely just as it got to the middle of the track. The rate at which the train was going is evidenced by the fact that the foil was thrown a distance of 150 feet, and as it hit, Mr. Thompson was thrown from it, uh, landing some 25 feet further on. So, tragically, Mr. Thompson's father was hit and killed by a train literally a, a little over a year after he graduated from college. And so, you know, that um, obviously would have been a, a difficult blow to contend with as a young man uh, fresh out of college and you know looking forward to moving on with his life and having his father be tragically killed like that but you know um, as fate would have it some other things came along that I guess kind of changed his focus uh, had to at that uh, for that matter and the main thing that came along was World War One uh, number five, if you would, Lee, this is a, a short blip here from the, Oklahoma, the Norman, Oklahoma Daily Transcript. And it says, a Miller Thompson, who was called here by the death of his father, leaves tomorrow for Camp Travis, where he is a member of the National Army. So he was drafted uh, November of 1917, um, literally the same two days after his father was killed by the train, he gets drafted to go in the army to serve in World War I. And so I didn't see anything or find anything about his service in World War I specifically. Uh, he obviously went, survived the war, and came back to Norman, Oklahoma, and went into business with another gentleman as a druggist. Now, number six, if you would, Lee. Uh, this article appeared uh, in the Norman, Oklahoma transcript, which is a newspaper locally. Uh, January the 17, 1926, and you see there at the bottom it says Lindsay's Drug Store. Uh, change of ownership of Lindsay's Drug Store. Miller Thompson and James Downing, the new owners, are now in charge. With practic uh, practically the same personnel, Lindsay's Drug Store will continue to give patrons the service of which the store has become famous. Both the new owners will be actively engaged in the business and ask for your continued goodwill. So. Prior to Miller Thompson and James Downing purchasing or buying out the owner, they were both working at the store already. Now, I'm not sure how long they were there as employees, uh, but in 1926, they bought the business outright. And that went on for a number of years, um, at least four years that we know of. Number seven, if you would, Lee. Um, May the 2nd, 1930, this article appeared in the same newspaper, the local Norman Transcript, as it was referred to locally. Jim Downing buys partner's interest is the headline. Miller Thompson retires from the firm. Now keep in mind, he's 30 years old. He was born right around 1900. I've not seen the exact birth date, but he, somewhere around 1900, maybe the late 1890s. But in any case, he's a fairly young man to be retiring, but he retired in 1930 from his partnership in the business and his partner bought him out. Uh, Jim Downing and Miller Thompson had dissolved their partnership in the Lindsay Drugstore and Downing has purchased the interest of Thompson in the store. Downing announced today. Downing is now the sole owner of the business. Downing and Thompson purchased the store about three years ago, soon after the death of Rhea Lindsay. Thompson has not yet announced his plans for the future. So maybe retirement is, is a bit of a overreach there. Maybe not really retired, uh, but he allowed his partner to buy him out, and so he decided he was moving on. 
Again, this is 1930, May the uh, 2nd of 1930. Three short months later, August of 1930, um, number eight, if you would, Lee, this ad appeared in the local paper again, the Norman, Oklahoma, Norman, Oklahoma Cleveland County uh, Democrat. This is actually another newspaper. It was like at Rocky Mountain Hill, like we had two or three different local newspapers. They had at least two that I found in Norman, Oklahoma. But this is announcing the purchase of McCall's Varsity Place by Charles DeVos and Miller Thompson. Now, as it turns out, these two gentlemen were actually half brothers. They shared the same mother and different fathers. That's why they had a different name. But Charles DeVos, or Voris, I guess you'd pronounce it, and Miller Thompson purchased this varsity clothing store, which again, right there in Norman, Oklahoma, the home of Oklahoma University. And so they, I'm sure, catered to the well-dressed college uh, people on, on campus there, particularly the men. Um, I'm sure they had women's clothes too, but it, uh, I saw a couple of different ads that seemed to indicate they were catering to the, the college-age men who were students there at Oklahoma University. And so, again, this is 1930. These two brothers, or half-brothers, have gone into business and purchased this clothing store there in Oklahoma. So, um, you know, one of the things that stood out to, I, I saw multiple uh, articles. This was a very close-knit family, uh, this Thompson family. Uh, and the, the divorce, or divorce, I'm not sure how you pronounce it. It's D-E-V-O-R-S-S, -S, I'm guessing divorce. But anyway, they were very close as a family, even though they shared a different uh, father, or had a different father and shared the same mother. Um, I saw several articles where there was uh, references to one or the other family member traveling uh, across the country in some instances to visit other family members. And so uh, apparently these two brothers got along good. Uh, they went into business together anyway. So this went on for a period of time. Uh, number th uh, nine, if you would, Lee, June the 14th, 1933. And this is very light, I understand. It's kind of hard to see on your screen there. Uh, but it reads, Miller Thompson, who has spent the last year in Rocky Mount, North Carolina, is visiting at the home of Mr. and Mrs. Charles Divorce to uh, 627 South Ponca Avenue. He was accompanied to Norman by his sister, Miss John Winston of Rocky Mount. Their mother, Mrs. W. L. Thompson in Albany, Missouri, is also visiting with Mr. and Mrs. Divorce. So the question now is, how did uh, Miller Thompson's sister end up in Rocky Mount to become married to Mr. John Winstead. I'm not sure how that happened. I'm not sure exactly who Mr. Winstead was, but this was, a, by all accounts, a fairly prominent family. Um, they kind of hobnob in influential circles, affluent friends, if you will. And so at some point, the sister of Miller Thompson and Charles Divorce ended up in Rocky Mount and ended up being married to this John Winston. Okay, so apparently at some point while visiting in Rocky Mount, visiting his sister, he came to meet a young lady here and her name was Miss Dorothy Dale, D-A-I-L, Dorothy Dale. She had a nickname of Dilly. They called her Dilly. Number 10, if you would, Lee, um, this article appeared in a Norman, Norman, Oklahoma transcript, November the 17th, 1935, and it says, North Carolina girl is bride of M. Thompson. Of special interest to Norman friends is the announcement of the marriage of Miss Dorothy Dale of Rocky, it says Rocky Mountain, North Carolina, to Mr. Miller Thompson, former Norman, Norman resident and brother of Mr. Charles Divorce. The marriage took place at 4.30 o'clock Monday afternoon at Richmond, Virginia, and the couple is now on a wedding trip to Washington and New York City. The bride, the daughter of Ms. Elizabeth Dale, has recently completed nurse training at Rocky Mountain, again, misspelling Rocky Mount. Mr. Thompson was reared in Norman and formerly was connected with the Lindsay Drug Store in partnership with James Downing. Later, he was associated with his brother in the Varsity Clothing Store. He left Norman about four years ago and is now owner of a drugstore at Rocky Mountain where the couple established, well, established a home. So by 1935, he's met uh, Dorothy Dale. They've gotten married. He's, got a, he's opened up a drugstore in Rocky Mount. And I'm not exactly sure. I couldn't find an exact date of when he came and began 
business in Rocky Mount, but the next, tell you what, Lee, bring it back to me. I just realized it's time for our first commercial break. When we come back from the break, we'll talk a little bit more about how this came to be, uh, where Mr. Miller Thompson came to Rocky Mount, uh, married Miss Dorothy Dale, and together they opened up and began running uh, Thompson Pharmacy. And so uh, there's a bit of a mystery coming up. We'll get to that when we come back from the break. So don't go anywhere. We'll be right back with more Way Back Wednesday. I'm Daniel Moss, owner of Cornerstone Funeral Home, and I'd like to invite you and your family to give our family an opportunity to serve you in your time of need. And we offer a full line of funeral services, everything from visitations to graveside services to cremations on site with a live crematory, as well as a banquet hall to meet the catering needs of our families that we serve. We offer catering service, we offer refreshments prior to visitation and services of our family, and we want to invite you to come and experience the difference here at Cornerstone Funeral Home. There's a main nerve that leaves your back that goes into your hip and goes down your leg. It's called the sciatic nerve. A back injury can put pressure on that nerve, causing pain, numbness, tingling. Chiropractors can actually help that. At the Hammer Chiropractic Center on Sunset, we know exactly what to do. We have very good relationships with the doctors in Rocky Mount. We like to co-manage people's care. Some medications may help us do our jobs, and our jobs may help their medications work better. We're back. We're back. Uh, if you're just tuning in, we're talking tonight a little bit about Mr. M. Miller Thompson. Um, I'm sorry, G. Miller Thompson. Uh, never could find out what G stood for. I'm guessing George, that's just a guess. But he went by Miller. I have several references that I've seen during the research here refer to him as Miller Thompson. Uh, his full initials were G. Miller Thompson. And I have, as I said, never found anything that specifically addressed what the G stood for. But anyway, by 1935, Miller Thompson and his wife, uh, Dorothy, or Dilly as they called her, uh, had set up shop, opened up Thompson Farms here on Falls Road, and by all accounts were doing quite well. Uh, she was a nurse, she had been trained at Parkview Hospital as a nurse, and was um, practicing her nursing uh, career there, and he was running a drugstore. And as I said, these were fairly affluent people. Uh, they traveled extensively. Uh, back and forth across the country. His mother was still in Norman, Oklahoma. His brother was still in Norman, Oklahoma. Uh, he had a sister in Missouri. And so these families would fly, I'm, I'm assuming fly, they could have rode a train, I'm not sure. But they would uh, visit back and forth with each other across the country from Rocky Mount to Norman, Oklahoma, to Missouri, uh, back to Rocky Mount and so forth. So, and again, you know, all indications that they were very close-knit family. I just, I, I just had a strong feeling when I was reading about these folks that, that they got along well with each other, they socialized quite frequently, and, and had a lot of friends. Speaking of which, let's go on to lead number 11. Um, July the 13th, 1937, this little article appeared in a Norman, Oklahoma transcript newspaper, and it makes a reference to the Miller Thompsons or picnic supper guests. And it says, Mr. and Mrs. Charles W. Divorce of 627 South Ponca Avenue entertained at their home Monday night with a picnic supper to honor their house guest, Mr. and Mrs. Miller Thompson of Rocky Mount, North Carolina. The supper was served in the garden of the Divorce home to a group of Norman and Oklahoma City guests. Those present for the affair were Mr. and Mrs. John Luttrell, Mr. and Mrs. Jim Corbett, Mr. Harley Wagner, all of Norman, Mr. and Mrs. Hugh Stoneham, Mr. and Mrs. Glenn Eddy, Mr. and Mrs. Norman Welch, Mr. and Mrs. Gerald Brown, and Ms. Tom Beller, all of Oklahoma City. Mr. and Ms. Corbett will entertain the Thompsons and Mr. and Ms. DeVos at dinner Wednesday night at their home at 111 State Drive. So you can almost kind of get a, a visual image in your mind uh, getting back to these being affluent people and very well healed in the community. Uh, these types of events and sup social gatherings and suppers and so forth uh, were, I, I saw multiple articles in, that referenced um, these types of events both here in Rocky Mount, 
there in Oklahoma and these family members flying back and forth, or at least traveling back and forth to, to be parts of this. So as I said, uh, from roughly 1933, 32, somewhere along in there, uh, when Miller Thompson came to Rocky Mountain and he and, and his wife fired up Thompson uh, Pharmacy, by all accounts, everything was going well. Uh, they both had lots of friends. They were both uh, frequented, uh, frequented parties and social gatherings. And so one would think that things were going splendidly. Apparently not so much. Number 12, Lee, January the 16th, 1941, this notice appeared in the Rocky Mount Telegram. And it says, public notice is hereby given to all persons having claims against G. Miller Thompson doing business as Thompson Pharmacy arising prior to January 5th, 1941 to present the same to the undersigned within 60 days from that date. All persons indebted to said G. Miller Thompson or Thompson Pharmacy will please make payment to the uh, present proprietors of Thompson Pharmacy for the said G. Miller Thompson who has sold said business to a limited partnership composed of E.L. Pierce, general partner R.H. Gregory Jr. and R.D. Wembley, special partners. Now, I shared this same article last week because I found it interesting, number one, that you know, in a span of roughly 10 years, a little less actually, because I'm not exactly sure when they started, somewhere around 32, I think it was. Um, by 33, there was already indication that uh, he was living here and, you know, so I think the business had already gotten started by 33. But by 1941, he's abruptly selling the business um, at apparently the height of its popularity. And the other thing I found interesting was that Mr. Gregory and Mr. Wembley, local businessmen, decided to go into the pharmacy business. Uh, to my knowledge, neither of whom had any, any knowledge or experience running a pharmacy, uh, but they were both certainly experienced businessmen and probably my guess is hired a, a, you know, someone certainly capable to run the business as a pharmacy. And this is in 1941. So then I said, okay, he's sold out his business. I assume he and his wife were moving back to Norman, Oklahoma for whatever reason. Okay, so I began looking for evidence and indications that Mr. and Mrs. Miller Thompson had left Rocky Mount and moved elsewhere together. That's not what I found, however. Let's move on, Lee. Number 13. Uh, this little short blip appeared in the Albany, Missouri Ledger, which was a local paper there in Albany, Missouri, uh, April the 5th of 1945. And it says simply, Miller Thompson of Norman, Oklahoma, notice that, is visiting his sister, Mrs. Ida Lanehart, and other relatives. So it doesn't mention Mr. and Mrs. Miller Thompson, and it doesn't say Miller Thompson of Rocky Mount, North Carolina. It says Miller Thompson, singular, of Norman, Oklahoma, is visiting his sister. So by 1945, Miller and Dilly, as she was known, had parted ways apparently. And in fact, she was still in Rocky Mount and still nursing, I found out. So let's move on, Lee. Number 14, and this is really blurry, I apologize. I've tried to make this clear and it just wasn't any way to make it any clearer. But October the 5th of 1944, and I got my uh, information a little bit out of sequence, I apologize. But this headline reads, Thompson Burial Rights to be Friday. And this is talking about the mother uh, of Miller Thompson and Charles Divorce. It says burial rights of Ms. Anna B. Thompson, mother of Charles Divorce Norman, uh, of Norman, will be conducted at the, looks like IOOP Cemetery here at 3 p.m. Friday. Ms. Thompson, 87, died Wednesday at the home of a daughter, Mrs. G.W. Lanehart in Albany, Missouri, where funeral services were conducted today. Ms. Thompson formerly lived in Norman from 1903 to 1930 and was well known here. She was a member of the Methodist Church. Survivors, in addition to the son and daughter aforementioned, include another son, Miller Thompson, Oklahoma City, and another daughter, Ms. Daisy Winston, in Raleigh, North Carolina. Reverend C.A. Denny, pastor at the First Christian Church, will be the minister in charge of the burial service. So again, uh, Mrs. Uh, Thompson passes away. Miller Thompson's mother passes away. Um, he's listed as a son, also listed now as a resident of Norman, Oklahoma. No mention of his former wife. And so again, the question arose, 
Where is she? What happened? What what happened between these two people? Um, number fifteen, Lee. This uh, article here appeared uh, in the Norman, Oklahoma Transcript, July the thirteenth, nineteen forty-eight. And sadly, G. Miller's uh, G. Miller Thompson's brother passes away. Uh, Charles Divorce has passed away at age sixty-eight. And it says Charles W. Divorce, sixty-eight, former Norman men's clothing store operator and salesman died in his sleep at 7 a.m. today at his home at 627 South Punk Avenue. He had been in ill health due to a heart ailment for a number of years, but had worked part-time until a month ago for the McCall Men's Store. A resident of Norman for 40 years, Divorce had worked for the late S.K. McCall and had managed McCall's campus store until 1929 when he bought the store. He retired about five years ago when he sold the store to Sam Gordon. He was a member of the Christian Church and at one time served the school board. Uh, he goes on to mention his uh, survivors, his wife, two daughters, uh, one sister, one half-sister, and one half-brother, um, Miller Thompson. And again, it mentions Miller being from Norman, no mention of Rocky Mount or the former Mrs. Miller Thompson. Okay, so that's in 1948. So I'm digging, I'm hunting, I'm trying to find some evidence, some indication of, you know, what happened to them as a couple what happened to him, uh, what happened to her. And so I kept digging. The very next article that I found that mentioned him specifically was literally 12 years later in 1960 when his sister passed away, Mrs. G.W. Lanehart here. Um, and this appeared in the Albany, Missouri Ledger, which was a local newspaper again there in Albany, Missouri. Uh, June the 30th, 1960, and you see the headline, Mrs. G.W. Landhart dies at 85. And it goes on to tell about, you know, she was 85, she was a widow of G.W. Landhart. Um, and then it says she survived by two sons, uh, a half-brother, Miller Thompson of Norman, Oklahoma, and one grandson. This was literally the very last reference I have found for anything related to Miller Thompson. Now, at this point, he's probably at the most in its early 60s. Um, not found a birth date, obviously, and not found a death date, obviously. I uh, have not found an obituary. So I'm guessing, as I said at the top of the show, he was born somewhere in the late 18, 1890s. Uh, he graduated college in 1917, it was. So, you know, even if he had finished high school early and say it was 15 or 16, which was not uncommon back then, by the way, um, it's entirely probably could have gone to college and finished up and still been a relatively young man of around 18 to 20 years old. Uh, it, that would put him somewhere being born around 1898, 1899, I'm sorry, 1890, yeah, 1898 or 1899. But the point is he was in his early 60s at, at the worst here when his sister died uh, in 1960. So I thought, well, surely you know, there would be some reference to him or something telling us, you know, where he went, what he did, what, what his occupation was, did he remarry, something, but literally nothing. It was as if the book was closed on G. Miller Thompson and nothing else was said about him. Okay, so fast forward literally 21 years later, number 17, Lee, the Rocky Mount Telegram had this obituary listed for Dorothy D. Thompson, the former Mrs. Miller Thompson. Now, there's no mention of him in this obituary. Uh, it just says Ms. Dorothy D. Thompson, former resident of Rocky Mount and a retired registered nurse, died Thursday. Uh, graveside service uh, Saturday at a Hollywood Cemetery in Farmville with the Reverend Charles Penix officiating. Charles Penix, by the way, was many of you may remember him. He was the pastor here at the uh, Church of the Good Shepherd for a number of years. Uh, but in any case, apparently he was a family friend and he knew uh, Miss Thompson. And so he was the one who performed the ceremony. But again, no mention of her prior marriage to G. Miller Thompson. And so we're still a mystery there. All right, number 18, Lee. This was uh, the Finder Grave. Um, I found where she was listed as being buried. Uh, at the uh, at Snow Hill Green uh, in Green County, um, at the uh, Hollywood Cemetery. I'm sorry, that's where she was born. She was born in Snow Hill, Green County. Uh, she actually died in Garner, 
and she's buried now at Hollywood Cemetery in Farmville, North Carolina. But again, no mention of a, of a Mr. Miller a Thompson. Uh, they apparently had no children. She has down below, she had um, a couple brothers and sisters, but no, no children. And so apparently they never had any kids together. And she apparently never remarried. Another, another mystery there. She was a relatively young woman when, when they parted ways in the 1940s. And so it's just really odd. I mean, she was only um, was it 66 when she passed away. So she was in her 40s when they parted way. And that's just really odd to me that she didn't remarry. Um, she obviously devoted her, herself to her career. And that's, I, I saw several different references to her as a nurse up until she passed away. Uh, but, but no other social circles or no mention of a boyfriend or another husband, obviously, it doesn't like that. And so, you know, as I said, when they sold the business in 1941 and went their separate ways, and then the business became under new ownership, and, uh, new management and so forth, it actually ran for many, many years. You know, when Parkview Hospital was in operation there, um, that was a very convenient pharmacy for people who, you know, had just gotten out of the hospital and were needing medication or for folks who live in that area, certainly up and down Falls Road, um, Thompson Pharmacy was the pharmacy that they went to uh, to pick up medicines for any number of ailments and issues and medical conditions. Um, you know, it, as sad as it is that it eventually went out of business, it had a, enjoyed a very long run. In fact, there was a continually operating business there um, for, oh golly, well from the 1930s up through 2015. Uh, number 19, if you would, Lee, this article appeared uh, September the 30th of 2015, and you see the headline, Long Time Business to Close Its Doors. Now, by 2015, Thompson Pharmacy was itself out of business as a pharmacy. Uh, there was still an operation going on there. There was a lady who ran a, a little gift shop called The Keeping Room, and so... Uh, and I think for a lot of people, it will always be known as Thompson Pharmacy, uh, even though the pharmacy aspect of the business had kind of gone by the wayside. Um, but anyway, um, you know, it's the building obviously, obviously is still standing there. To my knowledge, there's been nothing in it since it closed. If anyone knows anything different, let me know. By the way, I forgot to mention the phone number, 407-1111 is the number. As always, feel free to give us a call with your thoughts or ideas or if you got a, a, some input on any of this. But um, yeah, it's just, as I said, it's a little sad that uh, a thriving business, by all accounts, it was a thriving business uh, in a very short amount of time. I mean, from the time it got started in the early 1930s up until 1941, uh, all indications are that Thompson Pharmacy was doing a very brisk business there. Um, right across the street from the hospital, at that time Parkview was a very busy hospital. And so, you know, it, it's, it begs the question, what happened? Uh, we may never know. Uh, anyone who may would have any information about this has long since passed away by now, I'm afraid. So, um, and I, you know, I will keep digging to see what I can find on the, on the subject to see if I can uncover anything else. But I just thought it was very, very interesting and very curious, in fact, that um, a business that appeared to be doing so well was sold so, I won't say abruptly, though I, I think looking back you would have to say that it's odd that some, a business that was doing so well chose to close up. But if there was trouble in the marriage, and I suspect that's what happened for whatever reason, uh, trouble in the marriage made him come to the conclusion that he wanted to go by Oklahoma and she didn't want to go with him and so they sold the business, he left, she stayed, continued working as a nurse and the rest as they say is history. So anyway, okay I see it's almost time for our next commercial break so Lee bring it back to me. Um, you know I had uh, a, a suggestion and I'm, I'm always open for suggestions by the way for topics for shows but I had a suggestion uh, for tonight's show to see what was the oldest standing building in Rocky Mount that's still standing today. Uh, and so I went in search of, of said oldest building and my first thoughts um, were, of, were of commercial nature, you know. Um, and then you got to start looking at, well, a business that started out in one building and, and over the course of years ended up in other buildings, does that qualify as being the oldest building? Not really. 
you know, if it's the original building and it's been added on to, that's one thing. So that began my search to find out what was truly the oldest building that's still standing today in Rocky Mount. When we come out from the break, we'll talk about that. We'll show you some pictures and we'll take your calls. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back with more Way Back Wednesday. I'm Daniel Moss, owner of Cornerstone Funeral Home, and I'd like to invite you and your family to give our family an opportunity to serve you in your time of need. And we offer a full line of funeral services, everything from visitations to graveside services to cremations on site with a live crematory, as well as a banquet hall to meet the catering needs of our families that we serve. We offer catering service, we offer refreshments prior to visitations and services of our family, and we want to invite you to come and experience the difference here at Cornerstone Funeral Home. There's a main nerve that leaves your back that goes into your hip and goes down your leg. It's called the sciatic nerve. A back injury can put pressure on that nerve, causing pain, numbness, tingling. Chiropractors can actually help that. At the Hammer Chiropractic Center on Sunset, we know exactly what to do. We have very good relationships with the doctors in Rocky Mount. We like to co-manage people's care. Some medications may help us do our jobs, and our jobs may help their medications work better. We are back. During the break, I got a phone call from a caller who said uh, he had a little bit of information about Thompson Pharmacy. After uh, Wendley and Gregory, the two businessmen, took ownership and bought the business, they hired a gentleman named Walter Eason. And Walter Eason was a pharmacist. He ran the pharmacy and eventually became a partner. So there was three of them. If you remember from the article, uh, from the notice there, uh, there was also a Mr. Pierce that was involved with it at some point, too. I'm not sure what his actual contribution or or connection was to the business. But in any case, Mr. Walter Easton was a pharmacist there for a long time. And uh, as a gentleman said, he was also at one point a part owner of the business too. So just passing that on. Okay, so before the break, I mentioned that I had a caller who gave a, an idea, a suggestion for a show, a topic for the show, and that was the oldest building in Rocky Mount. And so I got to thinking off the top of my head, the first thing that came to my mind, quite frankly, uh, was the old water pumping station where the Moose Lodge is now because I knew that that was a pre-1900 building. I wasn't exactly sure that I had to go back and do some digging to find out exactly when, um, but I felt fairly safe in saying, well, that, that predates 1900, so what is out there today that, that's earlier than that? Because it turns out quite a bit. Uh, but in any case, I went digging. And so very shortly after, I thought about Stony Creek uh, pumping station and, and the Moose Lodge and so forth. I said, well, wait a minute. Rocky Mount Mills predates that by quite a spell. So I went looking and sure enough, uh, the Rocky Mount Mills area, if you, know, it's, if you think about the history of Rocky Mount, it all started right there, um, back to the 1700s, uh, shortly after the Iroquois, I mean, the, uh, oh, I just went blank, uh, Tuscarora Indians. Uh, after they kind of vacated the area, so to speak, um, white settlers came in here and settled right there in the area around the falls. And so the earliest Rocky Mountain inhabitants were right there. All right, so let's put up number 20, Lee. This is something we've seen many times. It's a picture I've shared on the show many times. As it turns out, this is, at least as far as what's in Rocky Mount today, the oldest home that I could find, and of course it's the, what we used to call when I was a kid the old Lewis home. Now we know it better as Stonewall Manor, but Stonewall, the old Lewis home, uh, was built about 1830. I've seen some differing opinions about that. Some say 1830, 1832, and I'm sure it took a year or so to build it. So, but somewhere around 1830 is when Stonewall was built. And by the way, if anyone, you know, I, I did a fair amount of research here, but I'll be the first to admit that as many old buildings as there are in Rocky Mount, it's entirely possible that I've overlooked one. So if you know of one that I don't get to or don't mention tonight, feel free to give us a call. Again, the number is 407-1111. We're going to be talking about some of the oldest buildings in Rocky Mount 
And oh, got a caller already. Let's get this call. Hello, caller, you on the air? Good afternoon. Yes, uh, I'm I'm pretty familiar with that. Cause that's over there by Rocky Mount called Stonewall. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Yes, Stonewall. That's a big mansion right there. <laughs> it is that. It sure is. Is anybody is anybody living in Stonewall now? No, sir. It's the uh, Preservation Society has got the home now. And uh, there's a is a nonprofit that handles the maintenance on it. And in fact, I'm not sure what the status is. There was actually a fairly significant undertaking uh, to do some much needed repairs and upgrades on the home uh, to kind of keep it, you know, up and operational, so to speak. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, I'm not sure where they are in that process. It still looks good, though. Well, this is from a 1940 uh, postcard you're looking at right here on your screen now. But yes, right. the home it does still look. It looks really nice. It sure does. Yeah. Okay. You think somebody would go in there and live in it and remodel it and you know keep it up, you know? Well, you know, a home like this, um, it would be very, very expensive just to maintain it. I'm sure to heat it in the winter. There's no telling. There's no telling how much it would cost to redo that building. Absolutely. Yeah. It would, it, you know, yeah. Probably tear it down and build another home just like it, cheaper. You could remodel this one. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You run in a lot of money when you start restoring stuff like that. Absolutely. Yes, sir. And yeah, and a lot of time, you know. Sure, absolutely. Probably a lot of sweat and tears built the first one. Absolutely, absolutely. I'm sure it was. Oh, well, look, yeah. thanks for calling in. Yeah, yeah. we're going to see you later, buddy. Take right. it that. Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay. So, as I said, 1830-ish, thereabouts, within a year or two, was Stonewall Manor, or as we called it when I was a kid, the old Lewis home. Um, and then, of course... We talk about Rocky Mount Mills. The Rocky Mount Mills, you've seen a sign on there, uh, says you know, established 1818. And so that the mill actually, uh, the original mill was built in 1818. Of course, it got burned in 1863 by the Union troops that come down through here. Uh, it was rebuilt in 1869. It got burned again by a disgruntled employee, is what the rumor has it. And then it was rebuilt, opened back up in 1871. So what's at the mill now? The oldest structure standing there now dates back to 1871. But there's another structure that's older than Rocky Mount Mills there at the mill, lead number 21, if you would. And this is the home of Mr. Benjamin Battle that in later years became the Rocky Mountain Mills office. And this home was built in 1835. So just a couple of years after, or three or four years after, the old Lewis home, or the Stonewall Manor home was built, this home was built. And you know the story that when the Union troops came through and burned Rocky Mount Mills, their intention was to burn this house too. And the occupant at the time was actually a, a implant, if you will, from up north. He was a mason, I understand it. And so the story goes that he said, look, you know, said, this home doesn't have anything to do with manufacturing any war effort supplies or anything else. Um, how about spare the home? And so these, worked out a, these, these gentlemen worked out a gentleman's agreement to spare the home and so it wasn't burned. Uh, during the Civil War when the troops came through here to, to burn the mill. Um, but yes, 1835 is when this home was built. Okay, so I mentioned a mill. Like I say, originally 1818, it was a wooden structure. It was burned in 1863. It was rebuilt. It was burned again in 1869. It was rebuilt again, opened back up in 1870, 1871. And so... Um, what I didn't realize until I saw this next picture, lead number 22 if you would, this is a picture that appeared in the Rocky Mount Telegram, uh, July 25th, 1982. And this is what I always heard growing up is referred to as the wheel hole. It's the area immediately behind the mill after the water comes through the mill, goes through the turbines and so forth, it comes out the back side of the mill at what they call the wheel hole. And, um, but the caption here is an interesting caption. I'll read it to you. It says, Original mill, the base of the original mill can be seen from the mill dam. Many windows have been bricked in, the, in on the back side and of the mill over the years. So if you look at the very bottom of that picture, that to your body of your screen, kind of running diagonally from left to right there, it's a little bit lighter texture uh, and it's of course not brick. It looks like some kind of uh, stonework maybe or I'm not sure it could be some kind of mortar or cement type. Um, but according to this picture anyway, that dates back to the original mill. Now, honestly, I, it's, it, there's no proof of that, and I don't want to say with certainty that, that this is, it, you know, goes back that far. 
We do know that the original mill itself was wooden because it burned and burned to the ground in 1863 when the Union troops came through here. But it's possible that that base there that you're looking at was what the wooden part of the mill sat on. That, in other words, that could have been the foundation for the original wooden mill. So that very well could be um, date back to the 1818 initial construction period for the mill itself. But the building, the brick building, this is probably the original, I say original, from 1870, 71 anyway, after it was rebuilt, after being burned a second time. Uh, but I'd never, never heard that, never read that, never knew anything about that. Um, and I'm not 100% sure this is accurate, but it's what appeared in the column, in the uh, caption here, that that bottom part you see there was part of the original meal. Okay, let's move on to number 23. Um, I mentioned Rocky Mount Mills, and this is what we know it as today. Of course, it's been extensively remodeled. Um, if you've not been in the mill recently, it's really neat down there. Uh, there's several businesses operating in there, and I've had the occasion on three or four times here over the last year or so to go into mall, in the mill and take a gander around. Um, I love these old mill projects where you take an old mill and rehab it, refurbish it, whatever, and then repurpose it and put new businesses in there. And they've done it, you know, um, CB, uh, Channel 5, the Goodman family uh, that undertook this project, I think, has done a really nice job of, of bringing this mill back to condition that it could be repurposed and reused. Um, but anyway, like I said, what you're looking at here, many of these buildings were built after the rebuilding in 1870, 1871. So not everything that's here dates back to that 1870, 1871 time frame, but certainly there is some that, that does date back that far. Okay. Speaking of the mill, I stumbled across something today that I had never seen before that I thought was really interesting. Maybe you will too. I, you know, I said before, my family, my grandfather worked for 41 years at Rocky Mountain Mill. My grandmother worked there. My father worked there for a while. I had aunts and uncles that worked there. And so the Mill Hill, the Mill Village is, is a really strong part of, of my history, my family's history. And so, and I knew that there were some houses down in the quote unquote mill village that dated to the early 1900s. And I stumbled across this right here. And this is really fascinating. Um, by the way, this is online. It's actually a, a project that was undertaken by UNC um, University at Chapel Hill. They came down here and they, they went through all the mill records and they identified these houses and the dates that they were built. And you look there, it, you know, this is just a sampling. This thing has got several rows. I just kind of took a snapshot from my computer screen and shared it with you. But most of these houses date back to 1889. There's one or two that are 1885. Um, so uh, my grandparents live at number seven uh, Spring Street, is my earliest recollection. Um, and that house was built, I think, in 1908. But prior to that, they live at number 12 Carr Street, and Carstreet is one of the ones that built around 1889 or 1890, along in there. So a lot of these old mill houses that are still standing date back to the early 1900s. In fact, some date back to the late 1800s. And this, there's a, a couple of different drop-down menus that appear on this screen when you go to this site here. And it's kind of fascinating to see a lot of information about these old houses. Um, and so anyway, I just thought it was neat, thought I would share with you. Okay, so I mentioned when, when the idea was first uh, tossed to me about trying to find out the oldest building in Rocky Mountain, my first thought went to the, the Stony Creek water pumping station down there where the Moose Lodge is today. Um, and obviously, fairly quickly, I realized that though that was not the oldest building still standing, but I thought it kind of warranted being in the grouping. So Lee, if you would, put up number 25. And the reason I say that, if you look at the caption here on this picture, um, and by the way, this, is, this building is still standing. It's there you, to the left, you see the metal building they added on in later years that the Moose Lodge uses for their banquet hall or whatever. But the caption reads, the city's first water plant on Stony Creek still stands more than 100 years later, now owned by the Rocky Mountain Moose Lodge number 938. The two-story brick water plant property is located on Country Club Road. Originally purchased for $266 in 1899, the water plant was erected in the fall of 1899 and the early winter of 1900. The property still shows evidence of foundations for various structures associated with the pumping station. Now, this picture is a few years old. It, it actually appeared in a, in a book, and I, I've shared this before on, on a prior show. 
and I, I think it might have been in that Rocky Mount record book that I found this. But uh, back in the time that this was, uh, in between the time it was um, the pumping station and the time it became the Moose Lodge many, many years later, it was the original country club. And there was a sandy beach here. It was a, a place for young folks to go and camp out, hang out, be out on the water there at Sony Creek. It was just a, a really fun place to be. But anyway, it's old. The building is old, obviously. Number 26, Lee, I see we're running low on time here. Um, Rocky Mount Telegram had this article uh, that appeared August 14, 1946. Imperial owns local factory. The local branch of the Imperial Tobacco Company of Great Britain and Ireland will be managed by R.J. Thornton this season. Established in 1904, the local factory stems, dries, and packs tobacco in hogshead for storage. And so I saw this and I thought, well, I, I thought it was older than that. So I did some more digging, number 27, Lee, and I found this historical reference here. And it's kind of long. I'm not going to try to read the whole thing. We're almost out of time anyway. But it says it was January the 1st of 1903 uh, in the Rocky Mount Motor. That was a newspaper, Rocky Mount Motor. There appeared a detailed account of the acquisition of about two acres of land on North Church Street, south of the present Brazel Memorial Library by the Imperial Tobacco Company for the building of their present redrying plant. Um, the track fronts on Church Street 212 feet, runs back an average of 360 feet, uh, roughly two acres of land. So. The land was acquired and purchased in 1903. Uh, construction began immediately, and shortly thereafter, uh, the Imperial Tobacco Company began operations. And number 28, Lee, this is, of course, present-day picture of what it looks like. Uh, the, it's now the Imperial Center. That's also a neat building to go in. I've been in there a few times over the, over the years. They've got a neat little pseudo-museum kind of sort of in there. Uh, there's an art gallery in there, uh, just some really neat old things. The building itself has been redone, so it's safe for the public to go through now. But some of the old equipment, the old furnaces used to drive tobacco and so forth is, are still there. That's a neat uh, one-day visit. You can go through it in, in an hour easily. Um, <coughs> excuse me. But it's a neat way to spend a little, little time. Okay, Lee, number 29, if you would. The 1908-1909 Rocky Mount City Directory, and I've starred two things there at the top. The American Tobacco Company, on the corner of Gold Leaf and Atlantic Avenue, and the Imperial Tobacco Company we just looked at there on Church Street. Both of these buildings are still standing, and this was in the 1908-1909 city directory. Of course, by this time, both buildings had been in operation, had been uh, standing for some time, a few years, in fact. Um, but they're both in use today. I thought that was interesting. And something else I found interesting, down at the bottom down there, where it says tobacco warehouses, J.C. Brazel, C.C. Cooper, of course, Gravely's, Cruz Warehouse, W.L. Petty Warehouse, Pitt and Crute. Uh, I'd never heard of some of these. And lastly, I want to get one more in before we call it a night, Lee. The oldest church I found in Rocky Mount um, is the Church of the Good Shepherd. And this church dates back, the church was completed in Easter of 1877. The original building was a small wooden one on the corner of Church and Gay Streets. The church was renovated in 1909. The wood was replaced with brick and the building was expanded. In 1921, land behind the church was used to build a parish house. So this, uh, I didn't know this, Church of the Good Shepherd is supposed to be the oldest church in Rocky Mount and certainly dates back to the late 1800s. So it's a very old church. With that, I think we're going to call it a night. I had a few more I wanted to share with you. I'll save those for, for maybe next week's show. I want to thank those who called in and shared your memories with us. It's always good to hear from the viewers. And um, thanks again for uh, the suggestions. I'm always open for suggestions for a show. So if you want to uh, hear about something or have me research something, give me a call. You can call my cell phone at 252-883-1123. Or you can call the station and say, hey, here's an idea for Rainer. Tell them to research this, and we'll get right on it. Folks, that's going to do it for us tonight. Take care of yourself. Have a great week and be kind to one another. We'll see you next week with more Way Back Wednesday. Good night.